Uh, I want to call something to your attention that we all know, uh, um, we all know intuitively whether or not you've thought about it explicitly. You go around the world and you find times and places where nations have excelled in one subject or another. There's a birth of that period of, of where they excel and then there's a peak and sometimes it drops off and sometimes they hang on. And so you can ask the culture of that. What was going on in that nation to support those discoveries? And then what happened when they ended? And so I, I call that sort of naming rights. If you were there first and you did it best, you name things. Particle physics uh, in this country, in the United States, was like going gangbusters after the Second World War. And, and the discovery of atomic elements, look at the periodic table. There's Berkelium, Californium, you know, we got half the United States up there in the upper, heavier elements of the periodic table. Uh, am I right there, sir, sir Weinberg? Okay. Okay. I don't wanna... <laughs> that's, that's not because the world liked California or Berkeley, it's because the work was done here. It's because there was, a, there was a, um, an effort to excel in just those subjects. And it shows up in other ways, well, I'll give you just briefly, you know, um, part of the naming rights is that you don't have to name it. So for example, while we didn't invent the internet, we certainly exploited it here in America. We did that sort of first and best. And so your email address does not end in .us. Everybody else is in the world, they gotta say what country they came from. We don't, okay? <laughs> It's, it's simple, but it's, it's the consequence of being there first and doing it better than anyone had done it before. Do you know that the British postage stamp is the only postage stamp in the world that does not identify the country of origin? Because they invented postage stamps. So why should they have to say what country it is? It's their invention. Okay? Check them out. It's, a, it's, it's just the facts of this. The constellations of the night sky, we, it's the Greek and Roman, and it's lasted to this time because they did a really good job thinking that stuff up. All the mythologies of the heavens, that really stuck with us. All right, so I'm going to make a larger point, um, not to get gratuitous on you here, but September 11, 2001, uh, as we all know, this was going on. Uh, in New York City. Uh, this is the view outside of my window. I live four blocks from ground zero. Excuse me, this is the corner of the building in which I live. I went outside to get this view. I was at the time judging whether I should go collect my daughter, who was in an elementary school two blocks north of the North Tower. North is to the right in this picture. So I wanted to get a closer view with a highly magnified uh, zoom lens to see what, while that was happening, the plane flew into the South Tower. And so no one was thinking terrorism until the second one was hit. The first one was just sort of a bad tragedy. And so these are just three frames from my camcorder. This is at t equals zero. This is one second, well, like actually a fraction of a second. The plane was moving probably 500 miles an hour. And just to understand, the black building, that black sort of monolithic building, that is 50 stories tall. This is New York City, people. So tall buildings are kind of, they're just all over the place. And that's just a hotel, a 50-story hotel and it's the, the, the towers are foreshortened because they're the angle at which this is shown. I put these up because a few days after this, President Bush, I don't remember where he said this, on the steps of the White House, in the Rose Garden or at the Capitol, in an attempt to distinguish we from they, the terrorists who flew these planes into the buildings and into the, uh, uh, went down in Pennsylvania and at the, at, in Washington, to distinguish we from they, he loosely qu quotes, a phrase out of the Bible by saying, our God is the God who named the stars. Now, this is before I was on his Rolodex, okay? Uh, because I could have helped him out there. The fact is, of all the stars that have names, two-thirds of them have Arabic names. So this was not, I don't think, his intent with that message. Okay? <laughs> While the constellations are Greek and Roman, the names are Arabic, all right? And the list just goes on and on and on and on. And so where does this come from? How, does, how, do, how do you get us, how does this happen? How do you get stars named with Arabic names? How does this happen? And it happens because, of course, because 
Hang on, just catching up with myself here. Okay, it happens because there was this particularly fertile period that um, Professor Weinberg duly discussed. Um, and around that period, that 300 year period, the intellectual center of the world was Baghdad. Baghdad. It was completely open to all visitors, all travelers, Jews, Christians, uh, doubters, which today we might call atheists. They were all there exchanging ideas. All of them. All of them. And it was that period where you had the advances in like engineering and, and biology and medicine and, and, and mathematics. All right? Our numerals are called what? Arabic numerals. They even stop and think about that? You know, who's, who, as in America, do we pause, take pause at this? Why are they called Arabic numerals? Okay, they fully exploit the, the discovery of the zero, create a whole field called algebra, itself an Arabic word. Algorithm is an Arabic word. All this is going on, and it's all traceable, not to some long thousand-year tradition in, the, in Islam. It's traceable to this 300-year period. This 300-year period. And then, so they had naming rights. The most expensive, beautifully uh, carved astrolabes come out of this period. There's a great collection of these at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, if you ever want to check them out. So navigation, celestial navigation, all of this is traceable to this period. And so something happened. And what happened, as was previously described, I was told, and I give, forgive me for repeating from what you might have heard, 12th century kicks in, and then you get the influence of this scholar, Al-Ghazali. All right? And so, so out of his work, you get the philosophy that mathematics is the work of the devil. And nothing good can come of that philosophy. That combined with other sort of codification, philosophical codifications of what Islam would, was and would become, the entire intellectual foundation of that enterprise collapsed, and it has not recovered since. Over that period, all these books were translated into Arabic on a scale not seen since then. And so, so, so why, why, why am I even going here? Because I'm trying to explain to you that the, you fast forward, the, the dangers here is that what, you fast forward to 21st century America and ask, what influences do we, are we feeling now? Because that, per, that naming period in Islam stopped and, and it never recovered. Because the, 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 the way of thinking about the natural world, revelation replaced investigation. Okay? So I fast forward to 20, 21st century, and what do you find? You get things like this. Okay? This is in America. All right? So now, what I find interesting is, is the, it's a level of passion that it requires to actually do. You've got to, like, pay for this, of okay? This. A, a sensitivity to the, the money aspect of it. But we all know tomorrow's economies will be founded on, uh, on, on innovations in science and technology, and, of course, that gets cut short if uh, we lose our civilization, as what happened in Islam in 1100. And the last thought I'll leave you with, which concerns me greatly, if you do the math, okay, you know, just look, you look at all the Nobel Prize winners there ever were, some even in this room, and ask how many were Muslim. And it's like one, maybe two, okay? I, I think a second one was in economics. And the one we referred to was uh, an, uh, described earlier, the co-winner of the Nobel Prize with Professor Weinberg, uh, Abdul Salam. And he's not Middle Eastern Muslim, he's Pakistani Muslim, okay? Now... How many Nobel Prizes are won by Jews? It's like the fourth of the Nobel Prizes, okay? Some high fraction of the total. And then you look, how many Muslims are there in the world? It's like a billion Muslims. How many Jews? 15 million tops, okay? So you to ratio these numbers, had Islam not collapsed in its intellectual standing in the year 1100, and you just do the ratios, they would have every single Nobel Prize today. So the fact that it's not only just a few, it's near zero, it is deeply worrying. I'm concerned about what lost, what, 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 what brilliance may have expressed itself and did not in that community over the past thousand years. 
And so what I want to put on the table is why, so that's, that's the end of my talk. But I want to say, I want to put on the table not why 85% of the National Academy rejects God. I want to know why 15% don't. And that's really the, what we've got to address here. Otherwise, the public is, is secondary to this. Thank you for your attention here.